And we're back with another installment of our blood notes as part of the cardiovascular system. So let's not wait. Let's just get right into it. What we're going to get right into now is called hemostasis. It's called the halting of blood. Essentially what it means is you, we are trying to keep blood from leaving the body in the event that a cut or something along those lines happens. So we call this a process that stops bleeding prevents the loss of blood through the walls of a damaged vessel and creates the framework for tissue repair. So it's got a three function uh, process to it of hemostasis. Let's watch a quick video on hemostasis. Alright, I like that video because it's simplistic, but at the same time, it also gets all the processes or steps of hemostasis actually right there in front of you in a very, I don't want to say childish way, but a simple way. So, your blood vessels are one of the locations of smooth muscle tissue. Remember the three types of muscle tissue. You have cardiac muscle tissue, which we've gone over, skeletal muscle tissue, which we've definitely gone over, 
And the one that we really haven't touched on too much is smooth muscle tissue. One of the major places you're going to find smooth muscle tissues around your blood vessels. They serve a couple functions. One of them is to regulate the size of your blood vessels so you can have vasodilation or vasoconstriction depending on whether or not you want to increase or decrease blood pressure or based on whether or not you want to change some kind of um, reaction to damage. So blood, vessel, blood vessels have walls of smooth muscle around the outside and inner layer of the epithelial cells. This is called the endothelium. It's not necessarily something you need to understand. That muscular layer comes into play here in just a minute. So in the process of hemostasis, you actually have three phases. The first thing is called the vascular phase. So when that wall of the blood vessel is damaged, cut, um, something goes wrong with it, those smooth muscle fibers actually will contract. And what that does is it actually shrinks the diameter of the blood vessel and causes the blood vessel to shrink in size at the location of damage. This is called a vascular spasm. So this is one way to they if blood blood flow is restricted to a wounded area or blood flow is restricted to leave the body is by taking that vessel shrinking the size of the vessel which then it shrinks the size of the damage so if you look at it like this these smooth muscle walls here and here would actually contract shortening the actual blood vessel hole so one it restricts the blood flow through the damaged wall and the other thing it does is it, it provides kind of like a smaller framework for all of the necessary uh, clotting factors, um, platelets, red blood cells to collect. This part of the hemostasis process lasts about 30 minutes. The endo, what then ends up happening with that is the endothelium where those muscles and the blood vessel walls, it actually becomes sticky. This is important because it allows for all of the necessary things to attach to it in an easy fashion. The second phase of hemostasis is called the platelet phase pretty simple in the fact that platelets are the major player here. Platelets, keep in mind, those are the packets of cytoplasm and enzymes and things of that nature that are shed by megakaryocytes in the bone marrow. These platelets attach to the sticky endothelium within 15 seconds of the injury and as you saw in that video they accumulate and accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. What this forms is called the platelet plug and it actually can completely stop the bleeding if there's a small amount of damage. If the damage is, I don't know, roughly the size of a bullet hole, exit wound, that is way too large for platelets to actually just take control and plug that up. Which is why a lot of um, biotechnology and research has been going into how to plug gunshot wounds and other major injuries using um, technology similar to that that functions like platelets. The next phase is called the coagulation phase. You're going to learn this term coagulation and you're going to learn another term called agglutination. Don't confuse those two but we're going to talk about coagulation right now. What it's also called is called blood clotting. It's not the same as agglutination. Um, it doesn't start until about 30 seconds or more after the vessel has been damaged. So you have to have the vascular spasm and that continues for an extended period of time while the platelet phase and the coagulation phase are going on. But essentially what occurs is you get the fibrinogen and the extrinsic and intrinsic factors all come together chemically and they react to attach to the side of the platelets wounds and the platelet plug and it changes to an insoluble, insoluble protein fiber. This means that it can't be dissolved. So that way as blood is flowing over it, it actually stays rigidly in place and can't be dissolved by everything that's inside of the blood. As that network of fibrin increases, you get things like white blood cells, red blood cells, more platelets, all of these things get trapped in there and helps form the overall clot as a whole. That blood clot then allows the damaged area to be sealed off and repair and healing can actually start occurring. Here what you're seeing are actual um, scanning electron microscope images of a blood clot forming. So all of this network, excuse me, of strings would be the fibrinogen, and here it's forming a hardcore version of the clot. Notice that there are red blood cells trapped within that. 
And then you have the fourth phase. Once all that clot is formed, you get what is called clot, clot retraction. The clot is formed, the platelets contract, and it pulls all the torn edges of the blood vessel in towards itself, and the wound gets closer together. This is why when you've ever had things like a, um, a scab or a cut or things like that, it feels tight around that area because it actually is pulled and contracted it in there. The last thing that occurs is you end up with the clot being dissolved throughout the process of repair. In the video they showed you there is a chemical substance, an enzyme, that actually breaks it down and causes it to go into the blood vessel in pieces. Those pieces or debris or waste products now have to be removed from the blood. That's where your uh, white blood cells and macrophages come into play and they actually are phagocytic cells where they eat those things, digest them, and then they are excreted as waste and gotten rid of through the kidney filtration system. Normally blood clots form in response to injuries which cause bleeding. Clot formation helps to conserve the body's supply of blood so that small cuts don't end up draining the body of all of its blood. The body's process for stopping the bleeding by forming a clot is called hemostasis. In this illustration, the blood vessel contains red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and tiny proteins called clotting factors. These components of the blood float together in a straw-colored liquid called plasma. When the vessel wall is torn open by an injury, blood begins to escape. In response to this damage, the vessel quickly constricts, reducing the flow of blood. This constriction lasts only for a few minutes as the body puts in place a plug to stop the bleeding. Platelets soon recognize the injury and begin to stick to the damaged surfaces. This is called platelet adhesion. The adhering platelets change shape and release chemicals which keep the vessel constricted and draw more platelets into the damaged area. These platelets are said to be activated. Additional platelets arrive and begin to stick to one another so that a loose plug is formed. This is called platelet aggregation. When tissue is torn apart during an injury, blood is exposed to a chemical called tissue factor, which naturally resides on the surface of tissue cells, or may also be displayed on the inner lining of the blood vessel wall. This tissue factor sets into motion the chemical reactions of the clotting factors found floating in the nearby blood. Around a dozen different chemicals called clotting factors circulate inactively within the blood. When called upon, these clotting factors participate in a complex sequence of chemical reactions to ultimately produce tiny strands of a strong material called fibrin. Fibrin strands form in and around the loosely arranged plug of platelets and eventually form a meshwork which tightly binds the plug together. This meshwork keeps the platelets from being washed away by the flow of blood and makes the platelet plug more watertight. Red blood cells and white blood cells become trapped in the meshwork as it forms, giving the plug its characteristic red color. The overall process of forming these fibrin strands to solidify the clot is called coagulation. So within a matter of minutes, a sturdy plug is formed to arrest the outflow of blood, but too much coagulation activity allows the clot to grow much larger than it should. Two groups of the body's own naturally produced chemicals help to limit the size of the clot. The first group blocks coagulation. These substances are known as coagulation inhibitors or natural anticoagulants. When these chemicals interfere with the reactions among the clotting factors, fibrin formation is blocked and no new fibrin strands are available to hold additional cells to the clot. In this way, clot growth is kept to a minimum. The other group of chemicals keeps clot growth under control by cutting the fibrin strands and actually dissolving part of the clot. These chemicals are part of the natural process known as fibrinolysis. Fibrinolysis occurs as chemicals called plasminogen activators are slowly released from the inner lining of the damaged vessel wall. 
These plasminogen activators trigger the destruction of the fibrin strands that hold the clot together. So coagulation inhibitors can only stop the growth of the clot, but fibrinolysis can actually dissolve part or all of the clot. In fact, when the vessel is completely healed, the remaining clot is dissolved by means of this second group of chemicals. To sum up then, rapid clot formation is essential for conservation of the body's supply of blood. We've seen the... All right, so you got your hemostasis, video notes ready to go, all done. Let's talk about snake venom and what it does to the blood. Технологии просты, но это смертельно опасный бизнес. Вот это ужас. Змеиный яд стоит кучу денег. Грамм высушенного яда стоит дороже грамма золота. Okay, so here's what's going on in this particular video. What they are doing is called milking a snake venom. They are essentially collecting snake venom for research purposes for the development of anti venom and believe it or not, snake venom is um, can be used as a key component in blood thinners. They're going to show you here in a second what the effects of this particular snake venom are on your blood. P.S. Everything in those pots are snakes. Через несколько секунд кровь свернулась, жертва, несомненно, была бы мертва. And that's what your blood turns into in the presence of snake venom. Not exactly an ideal situation for your blood. So here's a diagram reviewing all of those steps of hemostasis, going from the wound to the blood and the plasma leaving to the platelet plug forming to the fibrin, fibrinogen threads forming and creating the platelet plug to the cornified layer of a scab on the outside and on the inside working towards repair of the damaged area. If you have any questions, let me know.